Falcons defensive coordinator Ryan Nielsen is headed to Jacksonville. How big a blow to the defense is this? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $100 and $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host stumbling over the intro to the show, uh, Aaron Freeman. I've been covering the Falcons for far too long at FalFans.com. RIP should, you know, be getting that right by now since I've said it a thousand times on this podcast. But uh, if you don't know me, you may also know me as Sirius Black. You may also know me as Mr. Drew. You may also know me as Mr. A.K.A. And, of course, I appreciate each and every one of you that our everydayers here on this illustrious podcast that make this podcast your first listen, your first watch each and every day. And if you want to follow in their footsteps, all you got to do to become an everydayer, subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today's episode, we will be continuing our positional reviews, uh, started with the quarterback position yesterday. And today we'll be talking about the running back position, how those guys performed in 2023. We'll look deeply at B. John Robinson's rookie season. And despite the production, sort of where areas can he continue to get better? We'll revisit concerns about his usage. We'll talk about Tyler Algier's season. What's next for this team at the running back position? And, you know, will the next Falcons head coach embrace the two-headed backfield as readily as Arthur Smith? did and, you know, potential scheme changes that could affect uh, this run game in the future. But first, our big topic of the day is the news that Ryan Nielsen, the Falcons defensive coordinator, will be accepting the same role with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, that is a bit a blow to the Falcons. I don't know if it's a devastating blow, and we'll explain why. But, you know, this has been a move that seems to have been in, in the making for the last two weeks. We talked this past week about the very low probability that Ryan Nielsen was going to be retained by whoever took over as the new coaching staff. And that's one of the, the cons of firing Arthur Smith, if you thought that was a pro uh, in that regard. And, you know, I think there was some hope roughly 10 days ago when the Falcons initially blocked Nielsen from interviewing with the Jaguars that he was going to be part of this coaching staff. And I think that led a lot of people to think, oh, the Falcons are going to hire this type of coach, an offensive coach, so that he can keep Nielsen or whatever. Then obviously this past week, the Falcons did allow the Jaguars to interview him. And of course, that interview went pretty well because he wound up getting the job. So it's a great hire by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Check out Locked on Jaguars for what's next there. Uh, maybe we'll we'll get an appearance with Tony Wiggins uh, on that podcast in the near future to talk more about Ryan Nielsen. But in terms of Ryan Nielsen, he t- gets a ton of credit for what he did this past year in his one season in Atlanta. Uh, gets a ton of credit for the defensive turnaround, the defensive improvement this past year. Um, now, I probably won't give him as much credit as maybe other people will do, just mostly because of my general belief that talent trumps scheme when it comes to defense. I tend to have the opposite opinion when it comes to offense. And so that's why I think this is a blow, but maybe not the devastating blow that some people might look at it as. Now, it's not to sit here and say that Nielsen's scheme didn't really matter, um, but I just do think like when you look at the talent that the Falcons added this offseason, especially in free agency, you can argue that you know the the catalyst for their success was less to do with Nielsen and more to do with you know adding David Onyemata, Caden Ellis, Jesse Bates, who arguably were the three most reliable and valuable players on the Falcons defense this past season. And you know, to Ryan Nielsen's credit and his team's credit, like all three of those guys were great fits schematically in Ryan Nielsen's defense, right? Uh, and you wonder, you know, in those guys' cases as well as others, how great a fit they're going to be in the next scheme. Uh, should that change? Now, I think for the most part. Those players are all good enough, and several players on this Falcons defense are good enough to, uh, you know, adjust to different schemes. And probably the week after the Senior Bowl, we'll get uh, to the defensive positional reviews uh, as we're doing the offense this week. Um, and we'll be by that time, we'll probably have an idea on who the Falcons' head coach is going to be at that point, and so we can really dig deep in what those schematic changes 
mean for each individual player and each individual position group. Um, but, you know, for instance, take Kay Nellis. If the new scheme is not asking him to rush the quarterback that much, how much how effective is he going to be? Is he going to be 10, 15, 20 percent less effective in that scheme as he was in Ryan Nielsen's scheme? Um, and, you know, that has a significant impact on how this defense may perform uh, this season and in the future. But we will punt that specific conversation to later this offseason. Um, but, you know, the other conversation that we can somewhat talk about today is just exactly how good this defense was under Ryan Nielsen. It was very good. Now, if you listen to this podcast throughout the season, I probably wasn't as high on the defense as other people were when I think you looked at a lot of statistical categories and it people were like, this is a top 10 defense based off of those stats. To me, the eyeball test watching the film was this was closer to a league average defense uh, than, you know, I think people thought. But, you know, we saw throughout most of the season in some of those main statistical categories like points allowed and yards allowed, they were top 10 for most of the season until the very end when they gave up over 80 points and, you know, 400 yards each uh, in those final two games against the Bears and Saints. But going into that week, they were six in points allowed uh, and ninth in yards allowed. And then they wound up because of the, those sort of letdown performances at the end of the year, finished 18th in points allowed and 11th in yards allowed. But, you know, that's led to a lot of people for most of the season saying this is a top 10 defense. Now, I didn't look at that because I don't really not to say that those stats don't matter. Uh, Dean Pease would definitely disagree with me on the, on the points thing. But I tend to look at a more comprehensive look at defense in terms of what stats I look at. And this was something going back to the last time the Falcons were top 10 in defense in 2017 and points in, in yards allowed. And like I think that led to a lot of people then thinking, like, oh, this is a great defense on the verge of greatness. And around that time, I kind of heard about something that came from Pete Carroll that, you know, followed Gus Bradley to Jacksonville and, and – subsequently Dan Quinn here in Atlanta and sort of like six metrics to uh, measure defensive performance. And I, I think this is a better way of looking at it than just looking at points and yards, right? The six ways that you want your defense to do is you want them to stop the run. Number two, affect the quarterback, you know, get after the passer, right? Limit explosive plays. Number three, number four, create turnovers. Number five, get stops on red zone. And number six, get stops in the red zone. And there's many different ways that you can measure those six different areas. Like for example, affecting the quarterback. Do you look at sacks? Do you look at pressure? You know, I tend to look at sacks. So for me, I'm going to look at six stats. I'm going to look at run defensive DVOA. I'm going to look at sack rate. I'm going to look at, you know, number of 20 plus yard plays allowed for the explosive plays. I'm going to look at the percentage of drives that ended a turnover for turnovers, third down efficiency, red zone efficiencies. Those, those are pretty standard. So in run defense, the Falcons were 11th in run defensive DVOA this past year, which is a good de run defense. Now, if you look at other metrics like expected points added in run defense, they were like in the top two, um, but pass affected the quarterback. They were 19th in sack rate. And that's a massive improvement from where they were the previous two years, which they were dead last in both 21 and 22 in sack rate. Now explosives, they were tied for 18th in the most number of 20 plus yard plays allowed turnovers. They were 28th in the NFL third down. They were third in the NFL and red zone. They were fourth in the NFL. So, you know, not to say that this is the way that you do it, but if you were to average those rankings across those six metrics, that would average out to be the 14th ranked defense, right? So that, you know, not saying that that's what my opinion is based off of, but that kind of matches my eye test in terms of they were probably closer to league average in the top 10 defense. Now, if you did the same thing for last year's defense and average their ranking, they would have been 25th. So again, credit goes to Ryan Nielsen for massive improvements. And you can look at individual aspects and in looking at what Ryan Nielsen's impact on this defense, like the pass rush, right? Like throughout the season, we said, eh, this pass rush is not, it's better than it was, but it's not very good. Um, you know, but when charting the defense throughout the season, it was like when they were dialing up pressure, when they were manufacturing pressure, whether that's blitzes, whether that's stunts, and they were able to get more effective pressure than just simply relying on four man rushes, right? And just asking the, the four down the guys to get after the quarterback. And most of that comes from scheme, the simulated pressures, the creepers, all those various things. And to me, that manifests in other metrics like their pressure rate. They were 10th, according to pro football reference, in pressure rate. And so that to me is a reflection of what Ryan Nielsen specifically from a schematic standpoint, from a play calling standpoint, was bringing to the table uh, in that regard. So while I think Ryan Nielsen did an excellent job with the X's and O's, my personal opinion is that the Falcons defense improvement had a little more to do. Again, not saying Ryan Nielsen had nothing to do with this, but a little more to do with the Jimmys and Joes, so to speak. So we again wish him the best in Jacksonville. He absolutely fulfilled his promise. You know, we can certainly say maybe Arthur Smith didn't deliver on his promise, but the promise of Ryan Nielsen was let's get a reliable, effective defense that's going to put this team in a position to be competitive and win most games almost every single week. And basically through the first 
15 games of the season until those last two games, they were, you know, basically able to do that. So um, those are our thoughts on Ryan Nielsen. We will, you know, the, the coaching update uh, before we turn our attention to the running back positional review is uh, it was confirmed on Sunday evening. We talked about this on yesterday's episode that Ben Johnson did interview for uh, doing that initial interview. And that was important to get that done on Sunday because the, basically the rules prohibited that if the Falcons didn't interview him on Sunday, they would have had to wait until after the Lions season is over. And while the Lions are not expected to win next week in the NFC Championship game against the 49ers in a world where they did, they wouldn't be able to talk to Ryan, uh, to Ben Johnson, I'm sorry, until after the Super Bowl, right? In that circumstance. And so now that they got that done, if the Lions should win this week against the 49ers and do go to the Super Bowl, then they will be allowed to do a second interview with Ben Johnson the week after the uh the week leading up to the Super Bowl, right? So it's basically a full week before that they could talk to him. Right now, obviously, if the Lions lose this week, then they'll still be able to talk to him that same week. But that was an important thing to do. Obviously, the Falcons still have you know many second interviews set up this week, and that may affect their timeline for when we might get an announcement for who the Falcons coach is, but that will be a conversation that we'll punt to tomorrow's episode in all likelihood. So make sure you continue to make us your first listen tomorrow on the podcast so we can get into more of that and who they're targeting on those second interviews and whatnot. But today's episode, we'll continue talking about the running back position. We reviewed Ryan Nielsen's defense. We'll review the running back position. We'll look at Bijan's debut season. Did he live up to the hype? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. We'll break it down as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. Now, the NFL season is wrapped. The playoffs are still going on, and there's still time to get in on that action at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. When you place a $5 bet, that's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose you got to love FanDuel. The app is easy to use. There's so many different ways to bet over under spreads, player props, you know, Super Bowl picks. You know, that the Super Bowl props are going to be there, right? You got same game parlays. You can find new bets in the Explore tab, make a parlay bet in a parlay hub. That's a way to find popular parlays so that you can bet a little and win a lot. So all you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and you can make your first bet a layup. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. So continuing today's Locked On Falcons, guys, I want to plug the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel here on YouTube, the first of its kind, giving you all the biggest stories across all the biggest sports across, you know, the the number one planet in our in our galaxy, which is the planet Earth, um, you know, and if you're, you know, shrinking down to a little more local level, check out Locked On Sports Atlanta's 24-7 streaming channel here on YouTube as well as all part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So let's continue with our positional reviews looking back at the 2023 season. We talked about quarterbacks yesterday. We're talking about the running backs today. And you know, I think something I mentioned on yesterday's episode is, you know, Bijan had an excellent rookie season, but it did feel like, you know, some meat was left on the bone, right? His projection, his production was not far off my projections, right? I figured he'd be roughly a thousand yard rusher, roughly a 500 yard receiver. And he basically finished like a few dozen yards shy of both of those benchmarks. And I think a lot of people went into the season expecting those numbers to be much higher, you know, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why that was uh, a little bit later. But it's funny to me because I was like going into this episode like, oh, yeah, we talked about Bijan leaving some meat left on the bone. And I realized, no, we didn't talk about that during the season. That's a conversation that we had specifically about Kyle Pitts after his rookie season. That exact phrasing of Pitts had this great season, but it still felt like meat was left on the bone after his rookie season. And most of that was due to despite his historic production as a receiver in terms of yards as a rookie, Kyle Pitts, that is, you know, we did not see the impact in the red zone for Pitts' re uh, rookie season. and so. You know, I think that's a contributing factor to why so many were down on Arthur Smith. It feels like this has been a consistent through line with some of these high level prospects in, in terms of not maximizing his weapons. Again, you know, I probably don't feel like it's as simple as people make it out to be, but it is what it is. So, you know, I think a lot of that is pushed by the fantasy football community, right? You know, a lot of that led to a lot of people complaining about Bijan's usage or not getting the ball enough. And I thought that was 
you know, overrated. We discussed that during the season, especially when that sort of came into a frenzy after the Vikings game. Um, you know, I said then that Bijan's usage or lack thereof to me was one of the most overblown stories. I think there was only two games, in my humble opinion, where you could legitimately complain about usage. Bijan's usage. The first one was the the first Bucks game that he basically didn't play due to a migraine, and the second one was the um, second Panthers game where I think that was legit because the Falcons ran the ball a bunch on early downs in that game, and, and Bijan was rarely one of the players getting those carries in those situations. Um, you know, and I always try to be empathetic and understanding of other people's perspectives, but this is one that I just continue butt heads, especially with the fantasy football folks, because our priorities are just sort of different. And it especially frustrates me, I think, specifically because we did an episode in mid-July, right? And I'll try to link to that episode in the description below. But, you know, basically we talked, I, I did a whole, or not a whole episode, but the first part of an episode, like 10, 10 12 minutes, talking about why Bijan wasn't going to live up to the fantasy hype, right? He was being drafted as the RB3, and I basically said he was probably going to have projection in production closer to RB10. Um, and I think he wound up finishing RB12 this past year. And I even threw numbers out in that episode that looking back on, we're like, like 90 to 95% accurate of how it played out. Um, and so, you know, the profit strikes again, but I'm so humble, but you know, it, it was especially frustrating because on that episode, I basically said, this is going to be an issue for fantasy folks. This is going to be an issue for Falcon fans. They're going to be in shambles over this issue. And it's going to lead to people calling for Arthur Smith's job. And that proved to be prophetic. Um, and, you know, I see, you know, and, and this is why, like, I recognize I'm being unfair and it's like the way I kind of see it is like, you're all idiots for falling into the trap, right? It's like, there's a trap right there. And it's like, what trap? And it's like that trap right there. And it's like, Oh, I fell into the trap. And it's like, someone help me. And I'm like, why did you fall into the trap? But that's just kind of how I feel about it. But, you know, I think when it comes to Bijan, the one thing that you can say um, was a little underwhelming was not his usage in my opinion. Um, Cause I think as a runner, you know, Bijan played very well, even if the production wasn't quite to the level that we thought it would be in terms of consistency and being that, you know, dynamic explosive runner that's breaking you know 40 50 yard runs every single week and again i think a lot of that's owed to the blocking which is a conversation that we may get to at the end of this week uh when we break down the offensive line um but i think where he was a little underwhelming this season performing under expectations was in the passing game right you know looking at a, as a pass catcher looking at his route runner looking at his blocker now the blocking i think was a little rough the first like six or seven games of the season and then it improved in the second half so i'm not too worried about that moving forward Drops were an issue at times. I think some of that had to do with Bijan, you know, seemingly a couple of times posing for the cameras, trying to make these highlight reel grabs with like one hand instead of just, hey, man, my guy, just be normal and put two hands on the ball. Um, and that kind of speaks to a larger ball security issue that was a problem for Bijan this year, where, you know, he had one of the higher fumble rates in the NFL among the top running backs. Um, and the timing of those fumbles were particularly problematic because they always seemed to kind of swing the momentum back in the, in the opposing team's favor. And, and that led to the Falcons losing some of those games. Um, and I, I expect that's something that he will work on this offseason. So hopefully that will be better. But another thing I think he needs to work on this offseason is the route running, right? I thought maybe he needed to be a little bit more, have a little bit more attention to detail. And given his role at Texas, that was minimal, like in terms of what he was asked to do as a route runner, like we probably should have expected such a learning curve on that end. Um, but it was, I think it was kind of problematic for the Falcons because there was a large chunk of the season where the Falcons were kind of designing plays for deep Bijan as their go-to guy on third downs. And I don't think he stepped up enough reliably in those instances. And, and that led to some of the struggles that the Falcons offense had. Now um, I think all that kind of contributes to why, despite a good rookie season, um, just objectively, he kind of felt a lot of meat left on the bone. And I think some of that is owed to the hype that he was getting, which probably I was contributing to. And I think a lot of people went into the year sort of thinking, you know, he's going to instantly be Christian McCaffrey rather than understanding. And again, this was something we talked about in that July episode that like Christian McCaffrey wasn't Christian McCaffrey day one in the NFL. But I think there was high expectations that Bijan would be kind of that like elite running back right away. And there were moments where he looked like that player, but it wasn't consistently throughout the season. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch in the years to come as Bijan continues to grow and develop. You know, there's going to be that revisiting that conversation. Oh, you know, Bijan's going to be a much better player hopefully in the, in the years to come people are like, see, I told you Arthur Smith didn't know how to use him. And it's like, all right, it was probably more of that has to do with his success in the future is going to be less with how he's used and just him being a better player overall. Now talking about Tyler Algier, 
Um, I think he had a solid year, um, but I think the expectations again were probably higher than where he performed only because, but again, was it fair to have those expectations? I think we expected Tyler Azure to basically pick up exactly where he left off at the end of 2022 in his rookie season, especially in that back half of the season where he was very, very productive. One of the most productive running backs in the NFL. And he didn't quite live, but pick up where that left off. Right. Instead, his production was much more akin to what he was in the first half of his rookie season, which was solidly productive, but certainly not a guy that's like, you know, spectacular. One of the, five to 10 best running backs in the NFL. Like he seemed to be from a production standpoint in the back half of the season. And I think that fed into some of the concerns that fantasy folks had because, you know, Algier is a valuable running back. And unfortunately the Falcons to at least the fantasy community, the Falcons, you know, were consistently asking Algier to show his value. And I think, you know, the one thing that really stood out about Tyler Algier was being that sort of fourth quarter grinder, that closer to finish games, um, in a lot of ways, and, and that was a role that we saw Tyler Arju perform very admirably in the fourth quarter when the Falcons needed those tough yards. Just you know, hit number twenty-five in the backfield and let him go to work, and he did a great job doing that. Now, I think his production this year was more on par with one of the top RB twos in the NFL, like a top five RB two. Um, and I remember going back to the end of the 2022 season, his rookie year, sort of talking about what is Algiers ceiling. And I think many people, the response I got from many of you guys was like, oh, he has the potential to be a top 10 running back overall. And I, I didn't quite agree with that. And I, so I think he kind of fell back down to earth after that, you know, strong finish he had a year ago. Um, and again, I'm not trying to make this podcast about all the times I was right because I'm so humble. But, um, you know, going into and coming out of his rookie year, you know, I kind of comp Tyler Algier to Jordan Howard, right? And Jordan Howard was a player that had that monster rookie season, but then kind of slowly, you know, settled back into being more of that role player, that complimentary running back, as opposed to the feature running back um, that he looked like he was going to be his rookie season. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of where Tyler Algier is probably going to wind up being. Uh, and that's still a very good player that's going to definitely allow you to help you win football games, even if it's not going to be the sort of 20 plus carry grinder, you know, and being comp to Nick Chubb and Derrick Henry. I know some people hear that and say, that's crazy that anybody thought that no one thought that. And it was like, oh, people did. <laughs> I promise you, you can go back. I, I, I you know, I got the receipts uh, in terms of that one. But, um, you know, it's going to be interesting with those two players in particular, Bijan and Algier, whether the next coaching staff is going to be as open to those guys splitting carries as this past one was, right? You know, um, and so, you know, I think we'll see what the future is for the Falcons running back position, right? Is that coaching staff, what changes are going to happen? What's the future for Cordero Patterson, Avery Williams? Um, you know, are the Falcons going to have a different blocking scheme and how is that going to impact this position group? And we'll break that down as we wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. So if you're going to the big game, you know, what could you do with an extra hundred dollars in your pocket in Las Vegas, right? You could head to a casino. You could treat yourself to a fancy dinner. You could go see a show or, you know, you could do what I do. And I'm going to go to one of those seafood buffets. Uh, and, you know, game time is going to give you a hundred dollars off when you buy a big game ticket with their offer code Vegas 100. Of course, game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports comedy music and theater near you they got killer last minute deals all in prices views from your seat and their best price guarantee they're taking the guesswork out of buying tickets and right now all game time users get 100 off a big game ticket with code vegas 100 terms do apply but all you got to do is download the game time app use code vegas 100 that's v-e-g-a-s one zero zero for 100 off a big game ticket or if you're not going to the big game, just use the promo code locked on and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So as I said uh, earlier in the episode, we'll probably be talking more about the timeline of the Falcons coaching staff, as well as sort of who they're lining up for these second interviews. Um, you know, on tomorrow's episode, we'll also probably be reviewing the wide receiver position, assuming that, you know, we, have enough time to do that um and you know we'll be talking about speed 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 right and you know speed will be an element of this running back position as well but you know there's going to be a lot of potential roster turnover on this falcons offense potentially this offseason in in over the coming years depending on who the falcons hire as their new head coach 
Um, and running back is probably the one position group I would look at in the offense that, relatively speaking, could remain static compared to the others. Um, you got two more years of Algier on his rookie contract, three plus years on Bijan's rookie contract. Um, now, I wouldn't be shocked that the Falcons added to this position this offseason. Um, you know, but I think other positions you're going to probably see, you know, teams, sub the, the Falcons potentially subtract before they add, right? Like yesterday, we talked about the quarterback position and we talked about potentially Desmond Ritter after being the starter this year, being on the roster bubble going into next year's training camp, depending on what happens at the quarterback position this offseason. You know, if the Falcons bring in a, one of the pricier bridge quarterbacks as a starter, if they use a high pick on a quarterback in the draft, you know, there's a scenario where the Falcons decide to keep those two guys on the roster and Desmond Ritter is shown the door at the end of training camp. Now, you know, we could be talking about similar situations for some of these upcoming positions in the future, but I have a hard time seeing such, you know, a massive shift at this running back position with the Falcons moving off of B. John Robinson or Tyler Algier in the next two years. Now, that's not the same conversation when it comes to Cordero Patterson and, and Avery Williams, however. Now, Cordero Patterson turns 33 in March. And I think most people went into the season assuming that 2023 was going to be his final year in Atlanta. You know, I don't see any reason to, or I don't see, I won't say, I won't see any reason, but there's nothing compelling yet to think that you should change your opinion on that. But obviously we'll see, you know, um, I think CP is still a valuable runner uh, for this football team and, and showed that in limited opportunities. Um, and despite his complaints about those limited opportunities late in the year, you know, I don't think it's going to, his role is going to increase under a new coaching staff. So that I think probably moves the Falcons in the direction of getting younger at the position. Avery Williams is interesting. He's coming off an ACL tear, um, you know, and you would assume, okay, well, if CP's out the door as the kick returner, Avery Williams comes back in, he can return punts and be that kick returner. We've seen him be productive in that role makes total sense, but you know, it's just as equally possible that a new coach comes in and says, you know what, we're going to sign, we're going to draft somebody who can do that same role. Avery Williams is an Arthur Smith guy. He's not, or a Marquise Williams guy, the Falcon special teams coordinator. He's not my guy. Right. Um, and while I don't think the Falcons will likely draft another running back, cause I think they have just so many other needs at other positions. I wouldn't be shocked if they pulled the trigger on a late round guy um, or a priority free agent in that regard. Um, and you know, I think if they were to do that, the priority is going to be speed at that position. Cause I think the priority across the entire offense should be getting faster at the skill position players. Now in a world where the Falcons bring in bill Belichick, you know, um, we saw some of these smaller, quicker, explosive pass catching running backs like Kevin Falk, Shane Vereen, and James White have a lot of success in those offenses. Could that be the type of player that the Falcons are targeting? Could that be Avery Williams? Who knows, right? Now, Bijan could be that guy, but that's something that could happen um, in terms of reshaping this roster. Um, and I think that's an element that's probably underrated by a lot of fans that I think sort of assume, oh, the new coach is going to come in and just build off of what we've already built. And I think there's a pretty good chance that the new coach could come in and tear down a lot of things uh, before building it back up, uh, depending on who that coach is going to be. But I do think, again, relative to other positions, running back is relatively safe just because I think, you know, Robinson and Algier are safe. And, you know, even if other starters are going to be safe elsewhere in the roster, that probably means backups are going to get churned up. And that, is where Avery Williams comes into the conversation. So, um, you know, when it comes to the scheme, that's also going to be interesting. The Falcons could shift the, their run blocking scheme. Um, we're not going to get into the intricacies of what the different schemes are, but basically all you need to know is for the last nine seasons, the Falcons have leaned heavily on their outside zone scheme. I would bet good money that if you, if you had that data, you know, they'd probably be the number one team in terms of outside zone usage over the last decade basically and then on the opposite end of the spectrum you have a team like say the patriots right that's probably relevant that would probably be like at the bottom of the league in outside zone usage but would probably be at the top of the league in, in gap zone um usage and that's potentially relevant right um given who the falcons are looking at at the coaching staff standpoint so um that's probably a little bit more meaningful when it comes to the conversation around the offensive line which we should have later on this week uh, i think Bijan and algier can probably work in either scheme you know, I think Bijan can thrive in any scheme. He has a skill set to do that. You know, and Algier is interesting because despite coming from an outside zone scheme at BYU, um, if you listen to my scouting report of him when we drafted him, I thought his skill set matched better with a gap scheme type of running game. So, you know, that will 
opinion could get tested in the next year or two, depending on what direction the, the new coaching staff and new offensive coordinator want to go in. So, you know, that probably would be a deeper conversation when we get to the offensive line positional review. But, you know, tomorrow we'll probably get to the wide receivers. Then later in the week we'll do tight ends. And then, uh, you know, assuming that the Falcons don't make – a higher by the end of the week we'll, we'll have time to get to the offensive line before the, the week uh ends um but of course we'll also be talking about the potential timeline for that hire on tomorrow's episode that will probably be our plan unless some other big story emerges so that is what's in store for you on your first listen tomorrow check us out then it's all part of lockdown podcast network your team every 